Now, let's look at that important concept which specifies the dependent structure between the two variables. A very important process in the risk management. Right, uh, when there are two different kinds of exposures, I want to see what is the kind of relationship between these two of them so that if one of them is generating a loss, can the other one give me a profit or vice versa? Or if one of them is uh, leading me to a loss, will the other one also go into a loss? So, the dependence structure between the variables is very heavily uh, explained by the concept of correlation. And what we would be seeing is the correlation as a process will be more and more effective only if I am looking at the linear structure between the variables, linear dependency between the variables. But if uh, uh, if the distribution and uh, uh, generally what we see is the correlation is much more effective if the variables are more or less normal in nature. But if the variables follow any other kind of a distribution, irrespective of looking at their underlying distribution, if I am trying to find out the dependent structure between the variables, I am classifying them as copulas. So, we would uh, try to understand the concept of these two things, see how we can try to bring out the correlation between the variables and try to use them in the risk management process, especially uh, lots and lots of applications in the world of risk management depend on the usage of both correlations as well as copulas. Whenever we look at two exposures, I just have to see what is the kind of correlation? What is the kind of interdependency that is existing between these two variables? If it is very high positive, which means there is no diversification uh, effect that is coming because of these exposures. So, if one of them is leading into a loss, there is a good chance that the other one also can trigger me to a loss, which means the total exposure is going to be phenomenally higher. But if I see that the correlation is coming down, even the exposure is also coming down, the risk is coming down, and the moment I see that the correlation is going negative and negative, it even gives me an it even gives me a, a kind of an impact that the loss on one of the exposures can be offset through the gain on the other one. So that's one of the prime reasons. I end up computing the correlation between the set of or pair of exposures. And so, so from a risk manager's standpoint, how well I can estimate the correlation between the variables, how well I can estimate the volatilities based on the past data is what is a critical aspect for any of the risk managers. Two key estimates which are essential from an effective risk management perspective. Not just looking at what are the volatilities and standard deviations of the variables, but along with that looking at how the correlation between the variables is going to change in future based on the historical data understanding. And uh, the same extension will be done to the world of copulas, especially to define the correlation structure even if the underlying uh, probability distribution of the variables is not known. Even when the distribution of the underlying variables is not a normal, is not known, just by uh, uh, mapping it to uh, some known copula distribution, we are going to estimate the correlation structures. We'll look at that aspect. And what we see is, Copulas have very heavy applications. One, modeling the default correlation. We'll, uh, we'll look at it uh, as we move further. If there are uh, 10 different uh, bonds, what is uh, and each bond has a different uh, probability of uh, uh, default. And uh, so if that's the case, uh, and this is the kind of uh, correlation that is existing between them, how do I really estimate what is the probability that all of them can default? What is the estimated default rate overall? If I want those kind of uh, uh, evaluations, 
then I can very well rely on the Coppola based approach. Even we will see that various uh, portfolio of loans to compute their value at risk, they will rely on the Coppola based approach because they, it is more of a measure of interdependency between the two variables. And even Basel 2, as a part of its uh, regulatory guidelines, it has uh, taken the help of Copilas for determining the capital requirements. And even the credit, lots and lots of credit derivatives get valued using the function of Copilas, which means the understanding of the correlation between the variables and the Copila functions is very much essential for doing effective risk management. When it comes to the world of correlation, we know just to define as a formula, we say that the correlation between the two values, between the two variables is nothing but the covariance between the two divided by the variance of uh, or divided by the standard deviation of both of them separately the multiplication of the standard deviations of each one of them. That is what is bringing the world of correlation. If I look at it in the data here, let's say I have taken for the last one year, I have taken uh, the index values of the auto index, BSC auto index, BSC IT index and BSC Sensex. Let's say I want to find out the correlation Right, let's say I want to find out the correlation between auto index and IT index. All I am doing is I am trying to find out the covariance between. So, for the first of all, I want to do it on the returns, not on the index. So, I'll take the returns, I'll say returns of auto index, wherein I'll take the logarithm of. The current value divided by the previous. So the returns on the auto index go to these numbers. I would take the returns on the IT index as well going with the same formulas. The return on the IT index is giving me these numbers. Return on the IT index is going with these numbers. Similarly, I would take the returns on the Sensex, which also would give me some daily returns. So these are the daily returns on each of them. Let me look at the expected, right, average returns of the auto index. Average daily return on the auto index, if I see that it is somewhere around uh, 0 0.001, which I translate, uh, will translate them into percentage. Now, average daily returns I can take for IT index, which also works out to be uh, around 0 0.0005. And similarly, I can take the average daily returns of the Sensex, which works out as this. Now, try converting each of them into percentages on a daily basis. You hardly find them just around zero. Right. But yes, they are slightly smaller values. So these are what I can find as the average returns of each one of them. And now I can very well find out the covariance of the returns, let's say between auto and IT. I can find out the covariance of the returns between auto and IT, which comes out to be this small value. Covariance of the returns between auto and Sensex. Right, I would get some other number on the similar lines auto and sensex if i am taking the covariance this is the smaller value and similarly i take the covariance of the returns between it index returns and the sensex which also works out on some other lines which works out to these numbers similarly uh, i can find out uh, the standard deviation 
the standard deviation of the returns of the auto index the standard deviation of the returns of the auto is on a very smaller note then i am talking about uh, the standard deviation of the returns for it index standard deviation of the returns for it index working out to something around that and standard deviation for sensex the standard deviation for sensex returns is working out around this so probably let me uh, convert again these numbers also into percentages 1.02% happens to be the standard deviation of uh, auto 1.25 for the it index and 0.79 for the entire sensex which means now I can find out pairwise correlation, correlation between the auto index and uh, the IT index returns. Either I can do it as covariance divided by the individual standard deviation or I could do it as the correlation between the auto returns and the IT index returns. I could get this as the number. Even if I try out covariance between the auto index and uh, the IT index divided by the multiplication of the standard deviation of the auto returns and the standard deviation of the IT returns both of them should give me more or less the same number if I try to reduce the decimals both of them are matching with the same so that's how I can do between the various pairs and calculations wise Yes, it is covariance between X and Y divided by the standard deviations of both of them. And the covariance typically works out as the expected value of XY minus expected value of X multiplied by the expected value of Y. And I divide it by the standard deviation of X into standard deviation of Y. Now, if x and y are the same, probably this is becoming as expectation of x squared minus expectation of x whole squared, which is the definition of the variance of x and the denominator is also variance of x, so the correlation is becoming 1. And if I have to estimate the correlation, see for me, what is important is the correlation cannot be constant. I have to go with that. Correlation cannot be constant. It may keep increasing over time. It may keep decreasing over time. So, I want to estimate how the correlation is changing. If I had taken this whole data in one single go and obtained for this, it looks like for this entire period, the correlation was around uh, 0.08. I don't want that. I want the changing correlation on a daily basis. And that is where just like the way we estimate the uh, we just like the way we estimate the variances on a daily basis using the uh, exponential weighted moving average model or the gash model we'll use the similar models to estimate the volatility to estimate the correlation and covariances as well right so that is what will take me closer and closer to identifying whether the variables are becoming more and more independent of each other or the dependency between the variables is increasing. Because when do I say something is independent? If I know some value for this particular variable, IT has given me a return of minus 0.00852 on a single day. Now, can I predict what should be the return of the A? If I am able to do that, then probably the returns of A and I are dependent. But if I am not able to do that, that is where I say that uh, the A and I, both of them are independent. That is where I want to understand. Probably sometime back they might be dependent. Today they might not be dependent at all. So I can't take a universal correlation, one single value for all the period which I have determined long back, I can't use that number for the future as well because the correlation, the relationship between the variables keep changing across time. 
So whenever I have to define two variables as independent, it simply gives me a knowledge that if I know the value of one of them, using that knowledge, if I'm not able to predict the value of the other or the other does not really get impacted at all, that is where I say that the two variables are independent. Whatever is the distribution, whatever is the probability density function of x by knowing y, let's say some value associated with y, just by knowing a value associated with it, if I am still, if the, if the conditional probability distribution is not changing, then that is where I am saying both of them are independent of each other. And any typical correlation function, whatever we have got, the value is 0 0.08. It is a measure of linear dependence. In some cases, we may have non-linear dependency between the variables. We could see some variables will have a V-shape. Some may have a parabola kind of a shape. Some may have an extreme shapes like this. What we typically uh, see is when I try to compute the correlation using the covariance and divided by the variance, uh, standard deviations or use the typical correlation formula of Excel, I end up that the correlation will become zero. But in reality, there is a very strong relationship between them. That is where we have to really understand that correlation, whatever we are determining using this formula, it only brings out the linear relationship or linear dependency between the variables, any other non-linear stuff is simply ignored, right? So that is where we talk about not just doing the correlation calculation like this, probably I may have to estimate the standard deviation of y dependent on x. So we'll try to find out the standard deviation of y given x. It may so happen that it may be a constant. If it is a constant, then I can look at it as a bivariate normal distribution. But if it is not, then it can give lead to any other distributions as well. So understanding the relationship between the variables will really help me from this particular uh, possibility. Now, the most important aspect for me is monitoring the correlation from the data. So for this, how do I really go about deciding what is the way the correlation is changing? How was the correlation at some point in time earlier? And how is the correlation between the variables today? I really want to understand the correlations from this dimension. Now for that, yes, first let's start off with the daily returns like this. And I, am I have to find the covariances of each one of them going with, we know that this is the covariance, expected value of xy minus expected value of x into expected value of y. Now here, we have already seen expected value of x and expected value of y in isolation. They are very small values. So these in individually will take them as zero. This is what we have taken. Even when we were uh, doing using the GARSH and the EWMA approaches for estimating the volatilities as well. So that's the reason. Okay. So initially we'll talk about expected value of XY. Let's try to determine the expected value of XY. Right. Are probably what I call as XY. So let me try looking at uh, XY. Let's say I want to find out uh, the correlation between auto index and the IT index returns. So I'll find XY for each of the periods. Okay, I have found that this is the XY. And uh, I will also find X squared. Right, I'll also find uh, X squared. So this squared is what I'm going to find out. I've got that this is my X squared. I'll even find Y squared. 
So I'll get my y squared is going to be this much. So I got all the three calculations. So covariance here, because I'll ignore this expected value, I'll take expected value of x and expected value of y as zeros. That is the reason I'm getting covariance is nothing but expected value of x, y. Variance of x, I got it as expected value of x squared and variance of y, I get it as expected value of y squared. That's the reason I'm computing those. Now, if I really want to do the covariance, I mean, again, here, the logic is if I wanted to take the covariance, I should typically uh, simply uh, do it as the expected value, the average of this entire x, y. So this should be the covariance. If I give equal weightage to all, similarly, uh, if I want the variance of x going with this logic, then I have to simply take the average of this. Similarly, I have to go with the variance of y by giving by taking the average of this. But what I am more interested is, I don't want to give equal weightages to all. This is what is a regular process where I give equal weightage to all the last n days and say today the correlation is going to be uh, something like this. Covariant, even I find out the variance of y through this process wherein I am taking the average of all these and from here say that the correlation is going to be the covariance divided by the, the square root of the variance of this multiplied by the variance of this, which is resulting in the standard deviation. So I say the correlation is somewhere around point, right? The variance of this, variance of this resulting in a correlation of something like this. Now, I'm not uh, much interested in that kind of a stuff. Right? I'm not uh, looking at uh, such kind of numbers. I'm more and more interested in a slightly uh, different aspect here. I'm, I'm more and more uh, interested in doing an EWMA approach for finding the correlation. So I'm giving different weightages to each. I don't want to take a plain average of this. I don't want to take a plain average of this. I don't want to take a plain average of this. So that is where I'm going with an EWMA approach where I'm giving different weights to the different observations. So probably uh, the recent observation, if it, I will uh, give a value of, uh, if uh, uh, let's say I'm taking uh, different weights to different uh, observations. The recent observation, I'll give 1 minus lambda. All the previous observations put together, I'll give a weightage of lambda. So it's as good as saying, initially, okay, let me use the word covariance here. And initially, let me start off that the lambda which I want to go with, let's say I want to go with 0.95 as the lambda. Right? I want to go with uh, a lambda of 0.95. What does that mean for me? I want to give some weightage. What is the weightage here? Initially, let's say I am starting with the correlation here also. For the first very old period, I will take the covariance as the same as x1. Now, from the next period, uh, from the next period onwards, I'll go with this logic. Covariance per period n is lambda times the covariance of n minus 1 plus 1 minus lambda times the xy of the previous period. So I'll take lambda times covariance of the previous period plus 1 minus lambda times the xy of the previous period. This is the xy of the previous period, which gives me that the covariance here is going to be this much. And obviously, I can repeat this process across. 
So this happened to be the covariances. The same logic I can do with the variances as well. Okay, I'll do the variance of x where I'll do the same logic. Right, In, for the initial period, I'll take the variance as the same as x itself, which means here I'll take this lambda. This lambda, I multiply it with the variance of the previous period plus 1 minus lambda. I multiply it with the x squared of the previous period resulting in this being the variances on a sequential basis. Similarly, I can talk about the variance of y as well. Now, the variance of y if I am going with, again the same logic I can uh, apply. Right? If I am going with variance of y, for the first period, I will take the variance as y squared itself. From the second period onwards, I will take this lambda multiply it with the variance of y plus 1 minus lambda 1 minus lambda I multiply it with the y squared of the previous period resulting in these being the variances of y across. Now, these are the covariances, these are the variances of x, these are the variances of y. Now, what I can very well do is get these values in such a way that we know that the returns typically follow a normal distribution. So, go with a maximum likelihood approach. Go with a maximum likelihood approach under the assumption that the returns of A as well as returns of I, they both follow a kind of normal distribution. So, use, so if I have to say that something is following a normal distribution, the probability density function for it is 1 by square root of 2 pi sigma squared e power minus half x minus mu by sigma squared. This is what is the probability density function. Okay, let's look at it slightly. We have taken that the mu is 0 here. So, it is directly becoming 1 by square root of 2 pi sigma squared e to the power of minus half x squared by sigma squared. x squared is nothing but the return squared. Sigma squared is the variance. So, this particular function has to be maximized if something has to, if the returns have to follow a normal distribution. So, estimate that value of lambda so that the product of this is maximized or the same thing would uh, go into take the logarithm of all these. So, log 1 by root 2 pi sigma squared into e power minus half x squared by sigma squared. Now, you could really see, I can uh, separate each one of them. So, log 1 by root 2 pi, which is a constant, plus log 1 by sigma squared, which is as good as log sigma power minus 2. Or probably log 1 by sigma squared, I can keep it as it is, log 1 by sigma squared or root of sigma squared or it's as, uh, so log 1 by square root of sigma squared is as good as saying minus 0.5 log sigma squared and what about this plus log e power something means minus 0.5 x squared by sigma squared. So, overall it is coming out as minus 0.5 log sigma squared minus 0.5 x squared by sigma squared. This is what is uh, typically uh, coming out. So, I want this particular function to be maximized. Right, 1 by root 2 pi sigma squared. If I am looking at all these things, because this is a constant, I can ignore this part. 
I want log one by uh, I want one by square root of sigma squared. Uh, if uh, so, log one by square root of sigma squared. Probably it's as good as writing log sigma squared to the power of minus half. So minus half log sigma squared. That is what is coming out. And log e power something is directly coming out as minus 0.5x squared by sigma squared. So using this, I can very well try computing the likelihood function and the log likelihood function. So, applying uh, the log likelihood for x as well as for y. So, log likelihood for the returns of auto, if I am really looking at, I will look at it as minus 0.5 times logarithm of sigma square minus 0.5 times logarithm of, this is the x squared minus 0.5 times the logarithm of sigma squared minus 0.5 times x squared by sigma squared minus 0.5 times x squared okay this was the sigma squared not this minus 0.5 times logarithm of sigma squared minus 0.5 times x squared divided by sigma square. So this was the log likelihood with respect to A. Okay, so this was the log likelihood function value with respect to A. Similarly, uh, we can look at log likelihood log likelihood with respect to B or with respect to the IT index. I'll take the log likelihood with respect to IT index as well. So, which I'll get it as minus 0.5 times the variance of y minus 0.5 times the y squared divided by the variance of y resulting in this being the log likelihood associated with y. Right, minus 0.5 times minus 0.5 times the variance of y minus 0.5 times y squared divided by variance of y. So this was the log likelihood. So what I can do is the summation of the log likelihood across. I'm taking the summation of log likelihood is this thing. What I can do is I want to maximize this by typically changing this lambda. So I'll use a solver for this purpose, wherein my intention is to maximize this log likelihood by changing this particular variable. And I'll set a simple constraint that this particular variable is less than or equal to 1. And similarly, it is greater than or equal to 0. A few constraints I am setting and going and solving is saying in this case that the lambda is somewhere around 0.91 or 0.92. This is the one that has maximized the likelihood in this process. Which means now I could very comfortably compute the correlation across all these days wherein I will take it as the covariance and I divide it by the square root of the individual which is resulting in the standard deviation. Square root of the multiplication of the variances resulting in the standard deviation multiplication itself. So here the correlation was minus 0.33. Slowly from a negative here it became a positive correlation. And slowly what I am observing is right now the correlation is somewhere around 0.6. Right now the correlation is around 0.6 and probably if I look at the graph of the correlation between the return, I see something drastically different. 
I see that it is drastically different. Right, let me uh, insert uh, for this whole correlation, let me insert a line chart. Now what I could see is correlation has been fluctuating across. It was not a constant. Initially it was negative, but after that it was maintaining positive, yeah, fluctuating between this and this. There was a point, at some point correlation went even closer to 1 but always to a large extent fluctuating between 0 0.6 and 0 0.2, uh, 0.4 and 0.6. So that is how we could very well visualize the correlation using the EWMA approach. The same logic we can go ahead with respect to the Garsh mechanism as well, wherein instead of just considering two values, lambda, which is uh, giving a weightage to all the previous values, previous uh, correlations, 1 minus lambda is the weightage that we are applying to the recent uh, xy observation. Apart from those two, we are even bringing in omega into picture and omega is representing the long run covariance, average covariance, which actually comes out as the long run, uh, which because omega will become some gamma times the long run covariance. So long run covariance will become omega by gamma and gamma is nothing but 1 minus alpha minus beta. So this would become the long run average covariance and the same solver kind of a mechanism can very well be applied to arrive at it. Which means if I have to really forecast for the next period, tomorrow what is going to be the covariance or what is going to be the correlation, all I can do is for tomorrow, if I have to do this exercise, if I have to do this exercise for tomorrow, all it is telling me that tomorrow the correlation is going to be 0.6046. Today it is 0 0.6000. Tomorrow it is going to become 0.6046 going with the same logic. So that is how the GAR, the EWMA or GARSH models are helping us in terms of modeling the correlation between the variable which will really uh, help us to understand just not the variables that are varying even their underlying correlations are also changing over the period. Right? Now, if at all the consistency, if at all I am considering so many uh, uh, variables, looking at uh, their, their uh, covariances, variances, correlations, what is very much required is I need the consistency uh, to be checked. Now let's say if I am having three variables, x, y, z, all I am going to get is variance of x, if I look at the variance covariance matrix, variance of x, covariance of x and y, covariance between x and z, covariance between y and x, variance of y, covariance between y and z, covariance between z and x, covariance between z and y, variance of z. So this is what is going to be what is called as the variance covariance matrix which I can prepare for all of them. And this particular variance covariance matrix should be checked for internal consistency. When I am checking for internal consistency, all I would be doing is I will take an n by 1 vector. Let us say A, B, C. Right? So, which means this is a 1 by 3 matrix. So, I will take uh, the transpose of it, which becomes a 3 by 1 matrix. So, if I am taking, a, let's say, a 1 by 3 matrix, the transpose of it will become a 3 by 1. So, if I am taking a 3 by 1 matrix, the transpose of it is becoming 1 by 3. So, this is a 1 by 3 matrix, this is a 3 by 3, and I multiply it with ABC again. So, this is becoming this is a 3 by 1, so overall it is becoming a 3 by 1 by 3 multiplied by 3 by 3 is becoming 1 by 3. 
multiplied by 3 by 1 is becoming a 1 by 1 matrix. And whatever this 1 by 1, which is a single value, I want it to be greater than or equal to 0. That is where I call it as semi-definite. Because if I look at the calculation, it is working out that A times Vx plus B times Cyx plus C times Czx, that is the first element of 1 by 3. The second element is becoming A times Cxy plus B times Vy plus C times Czy. And now if you see, if I multiply this with A, it is uh, coming out as A squared Vx plus AB times covariance Yx plus AC times covariance Zx like this. Now, overall, if you are looking at doing the multiplication, it is an expansion of the variance of the portfolio. And variance is always a positive quantity, so which means it has to be greater than or equal to zero itself. So, I should typically get uh, for no combination of ABC, I should get this as a negative value. That is where I am doing the test for positive semi-definiteness. Only if at all I get this as a positive semi-definite, that is when I am looking at the computations of the covariance and correlations and variances, all of them are consistent. Otherwise, there is some kind of inconsistency in terms of calculations. When I am talking of inconsistency, Let's say I have used a, a lambda here, right? Here we have used a lambda and uh, let's say I have used 0.91. Now, between auto and uh, IT, if I have used 0.916 as the lambda, I have to be consistent in the usage of lambda, the same lambda even for auto and sensex, even for IT and Sensex, if the lambdas are differing, it may lead to different covariances and correlations. So, there should be only one single, one single lambda if I am using the EWMA process. So, that is where we are talking of consistency. Otherwise, there is a possibility that for some combination, we may get a value which is either greater than 0 or lesser than 0 as well. Right? So, any possible vector where the calculation goes negative, it's an indication that there is some kind of inconsistency in the calculations of variances and covariances, which we really need to be careful about. Then, looking at uh, the next important aspect here, which is the multivariate normal distributions which are one of the important concepts for calculating the correlation structure even for non-normal variables. So, first let's understand the multivariate or bivariate normal distribution for which I will take two variables x and y which are normally distributed. And the meaning is if I know x, I should be able to find the distribution of y. And what we say is y is normally distributed with a mean equal to mu2 plus rho times sigma2 times x minus mu1 divided by sigma1. This is the conditional mean, expected value of y given x is going to be this. Variance of y given x is going to be sigma 2 times square root of 1 minus rho square. Now, what I could see is the expected value of y is dependent on x linearly. So, there is a linear dependency on x whereas the variance of y, conditional variance of y, it is constant. And mu1, mu2 are the un uh, unconditional means of x and y. Sigma1, sigma2 are unconditional standard deviations of x and y. And if I want to really uh, generate a random samples using this process, right? The simple way, 
let's work out on how do I generate and find out the distribution between them. So I'll generate two normally distributed random samples. How do I generate in Excel the first sample which I call as sample 1 then I'll call as sample 2. I generate uh, two uh, independent standard normal samples. So I'll uh, use a normal uh, inverse standard normal inverse function where I use rand as a probability distribution rand uh, a random value for which I get the z values. So let me generate some 500 z values like this. So these 500 values have been generated from a standard normal distribution. Similarly, the Z2 also let me generate using the same process. Right, Z2 also I'll generate as the standard normal variable. So these two are Z1 and Z2 which are generated as standard normal variables. Let's say between these two, let me freeze these values. Let me freeze these values. Now let's say there is a correlation there is a correlation that is existing between them which is 0.25. Now what happens is I am doing a modified sample 2 now. Modified sample 2. Let's say by direct I am creating a correlation between them. It is working out as the correlation between these two is 0 0.01 almost unrelated. But if I want to generate a correlation of 0.25 for them, all we are saying is sample 2, I am going to do a modification where I will take it as sample 1, I will keep it as it is. Sample 2, I will take my target correlation and I multiply it with Z1 plus whatever was Z2, I multiply it with the square root of 1 minus the correlation target whatever was their square. So this is as good as the statement. The, uh, the epsilon 1 which is the first sample I take it same as Z1 but the second one I take it as rho times Z1 which is the correlation plus Z2 times square root of 1 minus rho squared. Now the sample 2 got modified in such a way, this became my sample 2. Now look at the correlation between these two. Correlation between these two samples is working out very close to 0.25. So using the data, I can generate the values. Now these are the two values for me. So if this is the first normal distribution, this happens to be the second normal distribution. Let me see that even this is normal or not. I can check out for the skewness, which will result in a value very close to zero. So it is very much normal. So what we are typically trying to do is we can generate these kind of data, which have, even though with, we are working with a random numbers whose correlation should be zero, by using this kind of matrix, we can very well generate the correlation of our choice. The same way, even though if I am working with multi variables, not just one, right? The, the simple intention, probably if I try to generalize this, I am generating the variables in such a way that the epsilon i, whatever, for each one, if I have to generate, all I am looking at is I am giving some kind of weightages multiplying it with the zk. I am doing a summation from k equal to 1 to i. Probably if I am looking at the first one, epsilon i, k equal to 1 to 1, alpha, whatever is the weightage. If I am looking at alpha k times zk. So the weightages are designed in such a way that uh, sigma al alpha k squared is equal to 1. So which means this is becoming equal to 1 itself. So epsilon i epsilon 1 is becoming z1. But if I am looking at uh, the second value here, if you look at it, it should uh, go in such a case 
that uh, alpha uh, 2 1 right uh, we are talking of k from 1 to 2 so alpha 2 1 z 1 plus alpha 2 2 z 2 this is what is the generator and now all I want is alpha alpha 2 1 squared plus alpha 2 2 squared should be equal to 1. This is what has to happen here. Alpha 2 1 squared plus alpha 2 2 squared should be equal to 1. And at the same time, I also want alpha 2 1 multiplied by alpha 1 1. So, I really want alpha 2 1 squared, alpha 2 2 squared should be equal to 1. Alpha 2 1, alpha 1 1 should be uh, equivalent uh, to the correlation that is existing between 1 and 2. So, it is becoming a variance covariance matrix. So, by knowing the first one, I am able to find out uh, this epsilon 2. Then, using the second one, I am go up to epsilon 3. So, it goes as a cyclical process. And uh, that one more important thing that we can look at in this uh, context is the usage of the one factor models. When I am talking about a one factor model, I am looking at okay different standard normal distributions. Okay, this is one standard normal distribution, this is another. If I look at whether this is standard normal or not, I will take the average of this, I am getting around 0. And if I am looking at uh, the standard deviation of this, I am getting around 1. So, this is still a standard normal distribution. So, Either I go with this and this, let us say these are the two different uh, standard normal distributions. What it says is each standard normal distribution has, I will identify one common factor. Let us say I can identify, uh, let us assume that this is a common factor, this, uh, which is a common factor standard normal distribution F. So, let me, uh, just for the sake of uh, argument, let me uh, create that this is one standard normal distribution with which sample 1 and sample 2 both of them are dependent on right both of them are dependent on this now what I am simply uh, saying is there is a relationship that we are building so let me try to establish the sample 1 as a factor of this. How can I establish that we can do a kind of uh, regression? So, the slope with respect to uh, these two, right, which is uh, happening to be the slope. So, I will take this as the independent variables and this as the dependent variable, finding out the slope, which is 0 0.03. And uh, when I am looking at the intercept, which works out to be the intercept wherein I take this as the independent and this as the dependent which is coming out to minus 0.3. Now, all we are saying is the same way whatever this particular independent variable is, I am expressing it in some form of AI. Look at the correlation that is uh, existing between the two. Right, you tried looking at the correlation that is existing between these two. It comes out that the correlation is 0 0.034. You could see some kind of relationship here. So, it is working out as Ai times F. So, I can very well write Ui as Ai times F. So, look at it like this. I will write this portion, let us say I want to write minus 1.33. So, I will first go with Ai, which is the slope times F. And whatever is the remaining portion, this is one component. 
the remaining portion i'll take it as square root of 1 minus ai squared times whatever is the zi so how do i get the zi there whatever i am getting as a sample i re i remove out ai times the factor and to the resulting one divided by square root of 1 minus ai squared so i get this particular sample remove the ai times f and to the resulting do it as divided by square root of 1 minus ai squared so this is what is coming out as another standard normal variable look at it whether this is uh, coming out as a standard normal variable or not so this is how the whole operation of so the fi's the hf and the zi's are identified in such a way that each of them is uh, the the fi's f and zi's are standard normal distributions ai is a constant between minus 1 and plus 1 zi's are completely uncorrelated with each other and correlated with f so the factor model is actually helping us in only coming out with n different parameters a1 a2 a3 an only n different parameters otherwise uh, if i am uh, going with the earlier approach of finding pair wise correlations coming out with a variance covariance matrix then with when variables i require nc2 correlations which is n into n minus 1 by 2 which is a massive exercise so probably a capm capital asset pricing model which is uh, heavily used this is more or less uh, a perfect application of the factor model only and what we could clearly see is the same thing can be extended to the multi factor model which we see in uh, finance the application of it is the arbitrage pricing theory instead of just using one single common factor f we are using f1 f2 fm each one of them they have a coefficient a1 i1 i2 i3 im and the remaining portion which is uh, uh, removing a1 squared a i2 squared a i3 squared from one that is an uncorrelated part which is not dependent on each other and also independent of each of the factors as well this phenomenon will really help us in terms of introducing the concept of copulas and trying to match these copulas to find out the correlation structure between the variables even if there is not much of a correlation that is existing between even if there is the distributions of each of them are not identifiable right